In this video, I want to talk about why the study of signals and systems is so important. I'll be covering two really core concepts in signals and systems, and I'll be pointing out how these uh, concepts are really applicable throughout much of science and engineering. And also, as you can see on this opening slide, I'll be covering the concept of a signal effectively being a function and a system effectively being, being an operator. So this is core concept number one that I want to convey, um, which is that of representation of signals or functions. Now, later on in this talk, I'll, I'll cover examples of signals um, and functions. But here, I just want to convey the, a core concept, which is how we represent signals or functions. And really, at the heart of signals and systems, there are two representations. Uh, there's the delta representation, and then there's also the Fourier representation. So first of all then, talking about the, uh, the delta representation, this really relates back um, to a well-known English theoretical physicist, Paul Dirac, uh, very much involved in quantum mechanics. And uh, he came up with this uh, Dirac delta function. Often we refer to it as just the delta function. And this can be used um, as a building block or a basis function to represent signals or functions. This is a really core concept in signals and systems. The other major uh, representation that we'll be using in signals and systems is that of the Fourier basis. This is now, rather than using uh, these uh, delta functions that I've shown here, uh, that I've linked with Paul Dirac, instead, we can also use a sine and cosine functions or more particularly and more generally, complex exponential functions, um, all of which uh, are composed of these sinusoidal-like functions. And we can also use these to represent or to build functions or signals. So this is core concept number one. How are we going to represent a signal or a function? So two representations. And these concepts will be repeated and unpacked as we proceed through this series of videos. Okay, so first of all then, quickly touching on the delta function representation of a function or a signal. So on the left-hand side here, I've got a, a function f of x. This is some value f depending on some other uh, value x. That could be a position variable, for example, for which we obtain some measured value f. So I've drawn some arbitrary function here to represent some arbitrary signal. And the point with the delta function representation, as I'm showing on the right-hand side here, is that we could use a lot of these spike-like delta functions. Here I'm showing them with a certain spacing, but uh, for the continuous description, these would be infinitesimally closely spaced together. We can use these uh, delta spike-like functions um, together with various amplitudes to, to compose or to build up this function, to synthesize that function on the left-hand side. So this is a, like a core representation. Another representation is that of, as I've touched on already, the sinusoidal or the Fourier representation of a function or a signal. So what I'm showing here in this animation is a sawtooth function uh, in black. And this, again, is just another arbitrary choice of a function f of, um, of a value x, independent variable x. And what we're seeing here is that by adding together sinusoidally varying functions of different frequencies with differing amounts, we can add them together to synthesize or to reconstruct, if you like, um, this function f of x. So this is like another representation we can use. And we'll be seeing the reason for this as we go through this series of videos as to why it is useful to have both of these representations of signals or functions. And again, I'll be getting on to concrete examples in a moment. Core concept number two that you really need to understand in signals and systems is that of convolution. Now, um, this, if you like, is one of the, the core uh, operators that represents uh, a system. And I'll go into concrete examples of systems in a moment. But um, just to say here, in fact, I've got a list of, of concrete examples. So convolution um, is a linear operation which can be used to model many different uh, systems that are very useful in practice, such as digital signal processing, such as uh, 
also imaging systems or pharmacokinetics, looking at concentrations of drugs in the blood, for example, uh, electronic circuits, amplifiers, mathematics, even the process of differentiating a function can be understood in this context of, of convolution. And then uh, artificial intelligence, deep learning, convolutional neural networks use as their core building block this operator known as convolution. So signals and systems, uh, we're dealing with signals or functions, but also dealing with systems. And the most common example of a system that we come across in signals and systems is a system that is modeled by convolution. So I'll quickly go over the concept um, in the coming slides. But before that, I'll just point out that this uh, convolution operator um, actually appeared in the work of some of the giants in science and engineering. So we've got Laplace, Fourier, Poisson, Volterra. All of these um, scientists uh, were mathematicians were using uh, the concept of convolution, although they didn't call it that at that time, but effectively it, it is uh, the operator uh, that's known as convolution. Um, now, it's also worth pointing out here historically as well that the, the term convolution can sometimes be referred to as the so-called uh, folding integral, Faltung integral, um, and we can see that in a later video as to why it can be called that. But I just want to also mention that this convolution operator um, is also an example of a so-called Fredholm integral, and that's um, named after a, a Swedish uh, mathematician, Fredholm. So all I'm doing here is just giving you a kind of a, a quick um, outline of some of the history and the central importance of the concept of convolution before now going into some concrete examples of, of what it is that it's doing. So as I've just said then, a, a signal or a function uh, can be represented or built up using these delta functions, these spike-like delta functions. Again, I'm just using it crudely here with with this rather large spacing, but in general, we're gonna need them very closely spaced together. And then what I'm showing on the left-hand side here as well is the fact that um, I could use, um, I could basically decompose that envelope of that function into different building block functions, which are here are the delta functions. So I'm showing one of them here, and I'm, I want to just show a second one here. So ignore that one on the left there. I just wanted to show that I could pick out two of those delta functions that are used to synthesize or compose this function I'm just showing two of them there, and I'm going to show what happens if we put those into a system that is modeled by convolution. So in this example, I'm just going to use a system that effectively is doing an audio digital signal processing uh, process, and that can be modeled by convolution. Here, this is just going to be doing high frequency boosting. I just want to very simply convey what is going on. So remember, a function or a signal can be composed of delta functions. Here are two example delta functions that I'm showing. If we run them through a convolution operator, which is a model for, say, an audio DSP system, then all that happens on the right-hand side is that these delta functions get replaced by a particular response function that is characteristic of the system we're looking at. So convolution just takes a delta function and replaces it with another function. And that's what I'm putting here. Delta functions just get replaced by convolution operators. And sinusoidal functions, remember that other representation I talked about earlier? Well, sinusoidal functions, when they go through a convolution operator, they just get scaled. And that's why that Fourier representation is so useful. And again, this is a concept that we'll be unpacking as we go further into these lectures. So to give an imaging system example, I just gave you an audio DSP example in that previous slide. With an imaging system, imagine I'm taking photographs of a very simple uh, a camera. And imagine here that I've got uh, different uh, stars in the night sky, for example. I could run one of them, um, take a photo of one of these stars using my photographic system. And at the output, I might, if I've got a very bad quality camera, I might get a blurred um, output as a photograph or an image, if you like, of that star. Here, if the star had been located at a different position in my field of view as I take a photo of the night sky, then uh, what happens now is that that, that delta function um, is just getting replaced by this blurring point spread function. Now, also, because uh, convolution is a linear operator, had I had two such stars in the night sky and I took a photograph of them together, then I would just get two uh, of these functions, these blurring functions called point spread functions. So that's just to convey this concept of replacing a delta with uh, with another function, with, with a 
in this context, a response function that's called the point spread function. And here I'm just showing that uh, the, the thing would operate in a very obvious linear way. So in other words, if a star was lower intensity, then I'd get a lower intensity or lower amplitude uh, output in the image. And so likewise, here I'm showing that I could image, take a photograph of two stars, one bright star, one less bright star, run it through a system that is my camera, for example, and if it's giving this blurred output, what we see is that blurring function uh, replacing each one of those delta functions. So I'm basically treating those stars as if they're pinpoints of light, like these delta functions I've talked about in the 1D example earlier. Uh, they just get replaced by point spread functions. But notice if the amplitude is lower in the input, then the amplitude is correspondingly lower in the output. So this slide, again, is just to give you a, a kind of a, a warm-up basic idea of the simplicity of the convolution operator, which can be used to model an imaging system or indeed to model many uh, other systems. And I'll, I'll give you some more examples of systems and indeed signals in the coming slides. So first of all then, let's touch on some concrete examples of signals. So here I'm showing a number of one-dimensional examples of signals or functions. Here I've got a, a voltage as a function of time, which is what we might measure, for example, by doing an ECG trace, where you put uh, electrodes on a patient and you measure voltage as a function of time and then perform some diagnosis as a consequence of those voltage measurements which change with time. So notice that's just a function, okay? So an ECG is giving us a, a function. Likewise, EEG for, for looking at uh, the brain. Again, we've got a voltage as a function of time uh, for all the various electrodes that might be placed um, on, on the surface of the head. Uh, another example of a signal or a function could be, for example, if we're doing functional magnetic resonance imaging, where they talk about the bold signal, uh, where what you could do is do multiple scans under different conditions, and we're going to get some kind of different response, uh, which depends on the condition or depends on the scan that you're doing. And, but basically, this is just tracing out another example of a function or a signal, and in this case, in one dimension. So a few more examples of just how ubiquitous and widespread functions and signals really are. Here I'm showing we could even be involved in finance. We could look at stock price, uh, P as a function of day, and then we've got some kind of discrete 1D function. Or indeed, uh, this recording in this video, I've got some audio signal as a function of time. So some kind of amplitude that varies uh, with time. That is also a signal or a function. So again, look how widespread these concepts are. Uh, in positron emission tomography, we could look at uptake of some radio tracer compound um, in tissues in, in the human body. So we've got concentration C, which depends on the time variable T. So not only uh, do we have those very practical examples of functions and signals, but also even um, in theoretical physics, uh, the whole area of the whole field of quantum mechanics uh, you've probably heard of the concept of a wave function. So again, signals and systems, we're dealing with functions and operators. Well, if you understand functions and operators, then you're in a brilliant position to better understand quantum mechanics because there we're talking about wave functions. So here I'm talking about, just giving the example of a wave function, um, some value which depends on some spatial position x. Now we may remember, those of you that looked at quantum mechanics, is that the wave function relates to the probability of finding a particle at a particular position x. And guess what? Well, uh, therefore, that wave function is just a superposition of the Dirac uh, delta function, just a whole set of Dirac delta functions. So like we talked about earlier, when we were synthesizing or composing a function from those building blocks, well, that's exactly how we can understand a wave function as, as a collection, a synthesis, a superposition of these delta functions, all of these different positions. And of course, you know in quantum mechanics, when you measure um, a particle of position, for example, this would just collapse to one particular, not exactly a Dirac delta function, but a, a very sharp function giving a very specific position for the measured uh, location of a particle. Uh, but to then go on to 2D examples, going back to practical ones again now, like uh, medical imaging, uh, if, we, if we measure uh, data in a magnetic resonance imaging scan, we'd get so-called case space data. Now, that's going to be very useful um, in signals and systems to understand what case space is, and we could 
touch on that in a later video. Um, and then this case space data can be related by an inverse Fourier transform, which will be covered again later on in this series of lectures, to, to recover uh, an image of a patient's brain, for example. In positron emission tomography, um, so this is another example of a 2D function that we could measure, a so-called sinogram, and we can reconstruct that to get another 2D function or a 2D signal that would be, in this example, a fluorodeoxyglucose image, which shows glucose, glucose utilization in the brain. So in medical imaging, we're dealing with 2D signals and functions all the time. In fact, higher dimensions, as we'll see in a later video. But also more um, straightforward examples, like taking a photograph. This is another example of a two-dimensional signal or function. And even this slide that I'm looking at could be regarded as a 2D function or signal. Now, of course, we could just have a grayscale value as a function of x and y, or indeed we could have an RGB uh, kind of vector, um, if you like, for each x, y coordinate. But it's still um, a, a value or a vector that depends on uh, two positions as an example of a 2D signal. Um, so going back to the quantum mechanics example now, um, for 2D function examples, we could actually be considering the probability of finding a particle at a particular location. So that's going to be um, depending on the spatial coordinate x, and then you'll notice this function is changing with time as well. So that's depending on x and depending on t. So that's an example of a 2D function. Uh, here, I'm just showing a wave function now as a function of x and y coordinate, another example of a 2D function, or if you like, if it helps, a, a 2D signal. But obviously, we talk about the wave function in the context of quantum mechanics. But again, this is really to motivate how important it is to really understand signals and systems theory, because not only does it help in science and engineering in general, but it also helps in other very interesting fields such as quantum mechanics. Okay, so what is a signal? What, what do we mean by that? Well, here in this series of videos, we're going to be talking about a signal as something that basically carries some kind of information that's of use to us. And mathematically, as I've been really emphasizing this video, what we're talking about, therefore, is a function. And a function is something that gives us a value which will depend on one or more independent variables. Typically, space uh, or, or time would be the classic independent variables um, which we put into a, to a function to then find some measured value, some kind of signal output result. Um, so as mentioned here then, the signal or the function values are often measured values. So they could be voltages, like we looked at ECG, EEG, could be pressures, could be concentrations. Remember the, the PET example I showed that concentration is a function of time. And um, the other point to note is that with these signals or these functions, we are often controlling the independent variable by our design. So we will often choose when a measurement is made, so the moment in time. Uh, the t uh, coordinate, if you like, in time, um, which will then give us some measured value, such as the concentration as a function of time of some drug in the bloodstream with that PET example I touched on briefly. Or indeed, with imaging systems, uh, we're often in control of where a measurement is made. The spatial coordinate x or y um, is that the x or y is now the independent variable that's going in uh, to our function to then give us some measured uh, response for that spatial coordinate. Um, and then, of course, the value of the function that we measure will depend on those independent variables. You know, where are we in space? Where are we, where are we in time? That will determine the function value that we get. And I'll refer you to those examples I've already given. So, as emphasized as well, signals or functions can have different representations. And that is really core uh, to signals and systems. You know, um, because those representations will make tasks of interest uh, particularly simple or straightforward to understand according to the representation that we choose to use. So that's why I'm drilling in the point here again that we've got the delta function representation where we're, we're decomposing functions um, into these uh, spike-like functions, these delta functions, or indeed we can decompose them into these sinusoidal functions such as the complex exponentials, which are basically sines and cosines. Okay, so that's enough about signals and, and functions. Let's, let's give some concrete examples now on uh, systems, just to say that just like signals and functions are more or less everywhere in science and engineering, um, you know, as also talked about in, in, in quantum mechanics, we deal with wave functions. Well, likewise, systems 
or operators are absolutely everywhere. So very day-to-day uh, -day examples like a microphone. Uh, this is an example of a, a system or an operator because it takes in some function, some signal, and gives out as an output some other function or signal. Uh, a webcam is dealing with like, if you like, 2D signals or functions going in. The, the webcam is a system and then we get some output. So again, remember, on, remember that simple imaging example I gave, that would be like using a, a webcam to look at the night sky and we, we image those pinpricks of light and then we get some kind of blurred response. So the webcam or a, a camera is an example of a system that maps one function to another function. It's an operator. Uh, likewise, even more uh, sophisticated imaging devices like a PET MR scanner or even just an MR scanner, these are looking at, at functions um, that are often, for example, uh, proton density in space and time that goes in an MR scanner, and then we get some kind of uh, measured output as a signal or a function. But the MR scanner is effectively a system. It's an operator that operates on some function to give some other output function. Also here, I'm showing that they don't have to be just hardware systems. We could also have a software system, like a convolutional neural network. Here I'm showing an example of an image reconstruction, a deep learning architecture, where we have some input measured data and we get some output reconstructed image just by passing it through a cascade of uh, operators. And in fact, a building block in that cascade, many of them uh, are using convolutions. So that's why I put it in here as an example. So we can have um, systems, operators, that are not just hardware, but we also have ones that are, if you like, uh, in, in software. And so um, just to concretize still more the concept of a system, I've been making the point it's a mapping of one function to another function, or it's an operator or a transform. Later on, we'll be dealing with um, the Fourier transform. Um, that's an example of an operator because it takes uh, one function in and gives another function at the output. But uh, really, the, the, the operator that's going to be of most interest to us in signals and systems is, is that of convolution to model a particular system, like an imaging device or an audio DSP. Um, so as mentioned, it maps an input function uh, to an output function. And the system, what it will do is typically modify, change, or process, or perhaps in some cases, uh, just transmit a signal. So here we've got some input signal or function going in to a system. This is like an operator. And what we get on the out output is a different function. So here, g of x in general is going to be some different function to the input one. And I'm just showing here some generalized notation, some system s being an operator on some input function f of x. Um, and so here again is, is another example of a set of different systems. Here we could have some patient that's uh, got some radio tracer injected for some, for example, for a medical imaging examination with a PET scanner. So the, the, the patient would go inside the scanner, we'd get some measured data. Again, it's just a function or a signal that comes out from our system. And then that, that input, uh, that, that measured data would now be an input to another system. This would be a software reconstruction system. Up here, the PET scanner would have actually been a hardware example of a system. Anyway, when we reconstruct uh, from the measured data by putting that through a system uh, that's reconstruction, when we put it through there, we get an output, which is an another example of a function. Um, that's an output signal from our system. And then even that uh, reconstructed image could be treated as an input to another system that could do some kind of analysis, such as, for example, looking at concentration as a function of time of the radio tracer in a patient's uh, bloodstream or in tissues in general, actually. OK, so I just want to finish with this slide and just really point out, therefore, that signals and systems or functions and operators, these are basically used uh, so widely in science and engineering. And um, basically, they're very crucial for understanding signals and functions that we're, we're measuring really useful for analyzing them, processing them, modifying, restoring, recovering signals, and also understanding what systems are doing when we make measurements. You know, what happens to the object that we're imaging? What, what, what is the system doing? And again, signals and systems are what gonna is going to really help us in our understanding of what is exactly going on.
Um, and again, just to emphasize, these are foundational concepts for understanding so many different areas, image processing, image reconstruction, inverse problems, DSP, artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, denoising, classification, amplifiers in electronics, pharmacokinetic modeling, you name it. There are so many areas in science and engineering, which whilst sometimes are more complicated than what we'll be focusing on signals and systems, what you'll find is that signals and systems provide you with a mathematical framework that really will underpin and be a core foundation for getting an even better understanding of many diverse disciplines within science and engineering. Thank you for listening.